Hello, once again Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. Going to do a video today talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy, but first a word of prayer. Father, I ask you to strengthen the faith of those who hear this message. Encourage them. Give them the peace that comes from only from you and your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you'll open the eyes and soften the hearts of the lost to hear this message. And that you would use this video in a supernatural way for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, again, <laughs> there's a lot to cover. Uh, a lot going on. And, and uh, you know, if, if you're not a believer, if you don't... Uh, not so sure about Bible prophecy, and uh, you know a lot of times these these events that I talk about, these news stories I talk about, seem like I'm bringing I'm kind of the bearer of a lot of bad news, but that's the furthest from the truth. I'm here to give you good news. I'm here to give you the best news possible, and uh, and and give you hope that even though the world is in complete chaos. God is in control, and Jesus Christ still saves. We serve a mighty God whose word is true, who has given us all the signs to look for, <clears throat> and all those signs are coming come to pass right before your very eyes. So let's, let's do a little bit of scripture first, then a bunch of news stories. As I said, we serve a mighty God. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And uh, there's just a, a couple of verses in Revelation chapter 1. I always, there was, I just like them. And, and they, they really, it's a great picture of who Jesus is. Revelation chapter 1, verses 17 to 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. That's a great, great description of who Jesus is. He was the, He's the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And yes, he has the keys of hell and death. Jesus Christ himself. And he will save you and give you eternal life. Let's go to Psalm chapter uh, Psalm 91. just kind of feel led to read a little bit of that today too. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm going to read a few verses in it. Psalm 91. <clears throat> he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler." Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Praise God. That is who we serve, and he will protect us. And again, he will give us peace amidst all of the chaos and destruction that we see happening all around us every day. With that, uh, let's get into the news stories because uh, there's quite a few. Um, <clears throat> if you follow my channel at all, I talk about how America is, is going to fall. Uh, they're, they're the last, we're the last kind of superpower out there, and there's going to be a one-world government. And for America to fall, 
well, for one thing, the, the economy needs to crash. And once the American economy and the, and the U.S. dollar collapses, it'll certainly affect the worldwide economy and open it up to the one world monetary system that will eventually turn out to be the mark of the beast. Now, <clears throat> if you listen to Barack Hussein Obama, you would think that uh, the economy is in great shape. But uh, this is an article today out of Smarter Analyst. <clears throat> I also saw this in Prophecy Newswatch. It says, 10 charts which show we are much worse off than just before the last economic crisis. It says, if you believe that ignorance is bliss, you might not want to read this article. I am going to dispel the notion that there has been any sort of economic recovery, and I'm going to show that we are much worse off than we were just prior to the last economic crisis. If you go back to 2007, people were feeling really good about things. Houses were being flipped like crazy, the stock market was booming, and unemployment was relatively low. But then the financial crisis of 2008 struck, and for a while it felt like the world was coming to an end. Of course, it didn't come to an end, and just uh, it was just the first wave of our problems. The wave that comes next are going to be the ones that really wipe us out. And we are headed very swiftly to that point in time. Uh, where the American economy, quite frankly the worldwide economy, is going to collapse. Look at the economy of the European Union and Greece right now, and Russia. No one's doing good. Um, so let's, I'm going to just highlight these ten different areas and, and read a little bit about some, most of them. Number one, the national debt. Just prior to the last recession, the U.S. national debt was a bit above $9 trillion. Since that time, it has nearly doubled. So what does that so does that make us better off or worse? The answer is obvious. It says even though Barack Obama promises that debts deficits are under control, more than a trillion dollars was added to the national debt in fiscal year 2014. Number 2, total debt. Over the past 40 years, the total amount of debt in the United States has skyrocketed to astronomical heights. We have become a buy now pay later society with devastating consequences. Back in 1975, our total debt level was sitting at about $2.5 trillion. Just prior to the last recession, it was sitting at about $50 trillion, and today we are rapidly closing in on $60 trillion. Number three, the velocity of money. When an economy is healthy, money tends to change hands and circulate through the system quite rapidly. So it makes sense that the velocity of money fell dramatically during the last recession. But why has it kept going down since then? <clears throat> Number four, home ownership rates. Uh, the, the, it says, were you aware that the rate of home ownership in the United States has fallen to a 20-year low? Uh, that's traditionally, owning a home is a sign that you belong to the middle class. <clears throat> and the last recession is really tough on the middle class, so it makes sense that the rate of home ownership declined during that time. But again, why has it continued to steadily decline ever since? <clears throat> Five, the employment unemployment excuse me, the employment rate. Barack Obama loves to tell us how the unemployment rate is going down, but as I will explain later in this article, this decline is primarily based on accounting tricks. Just prior to the last recession, approximately sixty three percent of the working age population of the United States was employed. During the recession, this ratio fell to below 59% and stayed there for several years. Just recently, it peaked back above 59%, but why are we still very, very far from where we used to be? And now the next economic downturn is rapidly approaching. <clears throat> Number six, the labor force participation rate. How can Obama get away with saying that the unemployment rate has gone down dramatically? Well, each month the government takes thousands upon thousands of long-term unemployed workers and decides they have been unemployed so long that they no longer qualify as part of the labor force. As a result, the labor force participation rate has fallen substantially since the end of last recession. Number seven, the inactivity rate for men in their prime working years. If things are getting better, why are so many men in their prime working years doing nothing at all? Just prior to the last recession, the inactivity rate of men in the prime was about 9%. Today, it's about 12%. Number eight, real median household income. Not only is a smaller percentage of Americans employed today than compared to just prior to the last recession, the quality of our jobs has gone down. Here's some statistics. 39% of American workers make less than 20000 a year. 52% make less than 30000 a year. 
63% of American workers make less than 40000 and 72% of American workers make less than 50000 We all know people that are working part-time jobs because that is all they can find in this economy. As the quality of our jobs continue to deteriorate, the numbers above are going to become even more dismal. Number nine, inflation. Even as our incomes have stagnated, the cost of living just continues to rise steadily. For example, the cost of food and beverages has gone up nearly 50% since just, the, since just, just since the year 2000. Food cost up 50% since 2000. And number 10, government dependence. As the middle class shrinks and the number of Americans that cannot independently take care of themselves soars, dependence on the government is reaching unprecedented heights. For instance, the federal government is now spending about twice as much on food stamps as it was just prior to the last recession. How in the world can anyone dare to call this an, an economy an economic recovery? Uh, there's, those are pretty, some pretty dismal statistics. And as I said, the, the world economy will collapse. The Antichrist will take over. Eventually, through things like Agenda 21, where they try to control the resources and control the economy, and Pope Francis is right along promoting all of this, there will eventually be a new economic system known as the Mark of the Beast. All right, let's move on, because I'm just getting started. Um, Netanyahu, <clears throat> uh, Netanyahu pollster, Obama role in Israeli election larger than reported. Can you imagine that? This is out of the hill. Um, <clears throat> says, President Obama's role during the Israeli elections was larger than reported. What was not well reported in the American media, media is that President Obama and his, and his allies were playing in the election to defeat Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, there was money moving that included taxpayer U.S. dollars through nonprofit organizations, and there were various liberal groups in the United States that were raising millions to fund a campaign called V15 against Netanyahu. He noted an effort to oust Netanyahu was guided by former polit Obama political operative Jeremy Byrd and that V15 or v Victory 15 ads hurt Netanyahu in the polls. McLaughlin said the, leading, the, the Israeli leader re rebounded after delivering a speech to Congress earlier this month, prompting more, cri more critical ads. McLaughlin also cited an effort to organize the Israeli Arabs, Arabs into one party and teach them about voter turnout. The State Department people in the end of January, early February, expedited visas for Israeli Arab leaders to come to the United States to learn how to vote. There were people in the United States that were organizing them to vote in one party so they would help the left-center candidate Herzog that the Obama administration favored. <clears throat> Already tense relations between Netanyahu <clears throat> and Obama escalated this week after Netanyahu's pre-election promise to not allow a Palestinian state. <clears throat> they were running an acorn, Obama organizing for America type campaign over there with digital ads, the billboards, the phones. They were targeting Israeli voters. <clears throat> I think the president Tuesday night felt like he lost, <clears throat> along with Senator... T uh, <clears throat> Okay, so they, th they said they felt like Obama lost this, he feels like he lost the election. Well, again, it's amazing how involved he was in trying to overthrow Netanyahu. And I, again, I cannot stress enough how bad that's going to vote, bode for America when we're turning against Israel like this. All right, uh, here's, an, here's an interesting story about Israel and uh, Iran. This is out of Prophecy News Watch today. Israel closer than ever to decision on hitting Iran. Again, it's looking like there's not going to be, well, it doesn't matter, honestly, whether there's going to be a nuclear agreement with Iran or not. It really does not matter. Because they won't obey whatever agreement they have anyway. They're committed to the annihilation of America and Israel. Um, so Israel's probably going to take matters into their own hands. In this article, Israel closer than ever to decision on hitting Iran. Benjamin Netanyahu scored a surprisingly comfortable win in Tuesday's elections, and former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations John Bolton said the vote was a stinging defeat for Obama that will make Iran far more nervous and probably lead to more appeasement from the U.S. in nuclear negotiations. Uh, <clears throat> the results also follow Obama 
uh, political operative Jeremy Bird. I, I won't get into that again. I just talked about that. Um, let's see here. Let me get down to where it talks about the, the Iran part. When people thought about the consequences of replacing him, they realized that there just isn't anybody in the polit Israeli political scene who can do the job that Netanyahu can do on these vital security issues. How has Israel triumphed through four major wars and survived relentless terrorist attacks? Meet the actual people who live through what can only be described as miracles in bi of biblical proportions and share the remarkable stories and against all odds Israel survives. Bolton admits that all political parties are adamantly opposed to Iran acquiring nuclear weapons, but he said that the difference between how Netanyahu and Labor candidate Isaac Herzog would approach the issue is immense. There would be a much greater willingness to follow Barack Obama's lead, much closer views on creating a Palestinian state. Therefore, the ability of Barack Obama to pressure Herzog or Zippy Libby government not to act militarily against Iran would have been overwhelming. Whereas now I think he has essentially zero influence on Bibi Netanyahu. The threat of military action is the major chip Israel has while Iran and the U.S. negotiate a possible deal over the nuclear program. Iran has to worry that a newly elected, re-elected Netanyahu with a solid win in this election is on much firmer base if he decides to use force against the Iranian leader's uh, nuclear weapons program. The most significant outcome is that we are closer to decision one way or another whether Israel is going to use force. The weakness Obama has shown over these past several years in his desperate efforts to get a deal with Iran finally convinced the likes of Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Turkey that the United States was simply not going to do anything effective to stop Israel. Uh, Bolton said he has a pretty good idea how that will play out in the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> this will be an agreement in principle according to the schedule that was laid out last year. I think it's also possible the administration is so desperate for a deal that if we get to the end of March, they're not in, inside of it. They will nonetheless say they're going to take keep negotiating because we're getting close, who said Bolton, who warned that, that would be a terrible sign. That's the sign of somebody who's just willing to make more concessions, he said. I think that's exactly how Iran will read it. Again, we are living in perilous times. Uh, no question about that. Uh, and again, we're hearing of wars and rumors of wars constantly, uh, which again, Jesus said in the Gospels, in, in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13, that uh, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, all right, here's a story about the technology, that, and quite frankly, the type of technology that could be used for the mark of the beast. I'm just going to touch on this one real quick. Um, <clears throat> Microsoft Windows. Hello will make your face, fingers, or iris the new sign-in. Rule With biometric authentic authentication for Windows 10 devices, the world's largest software maker hopes to make it harder for hackers to scoop up your data. I've said this so many times in the past, I'm going to say it again. The Mark of the Beast, one major reason people are going to accept the Mark of the Beast is it's going to be promoted that it's going to keep you safe. It's going to be convenient, but it's going to be safe. It won't be able to be hacked. People won't be able to steal your identity. Um... And plus, it's just cool because you can do things like turn on lights and open doors without a key and use your hand, use the biometrics. Uh, it's cutting edge. It's just a cool thing to do. That's how people are going to, just like having the latest smartphone when it comes out. Everybody wants to have that kind of technology, and people are already being um, indoctrinated to accept the mark of the beast. It says, Microsoft is the latest tech company to turn our bodies into passwords. With Windows Hello announced Tuesday, users of the upcoming Windows 10 operating system will be able to sign into their devices using their fingerprint, their face, or even their, the iris of their eye. Uh, Microsoft is expected to release Windows 10 later this year. You, uniquely you, plus your device, are the keys to your Windows experience, apps, data, and even websites and services. Not a random assortment of letters and numbers that are easily forgotten, hacked, or written down and pinned to a bulletin board. 
as Belfour points out, we live in an age of constant cyber threat. Hacking has become a full-time job with professional cyber criminals breaching the computer systems of companies, financial institutions, and even government agencies. Yet despite these nearly continual cyber attacks, customers still rely on passwords to unlock everything from their bank accounts to their emails. Biometric authentication, which, con which confirms people... Uh, who people are using by using their unique physical characteristics promises to put an additional wall of security between devices and malicious third parties. Though a fingerprint will always be more secure than password 1234, people sometimes worry whether hackers can find a way to access their, bio, their biometrics. Belfour says not to worry. We understand how critical it is to protect your biometric data from theft, and for this reason, your biometric signature is secured locally on the device and shared with no one but you. Uh, it is a solution that government, defense, financial, health care, and other related organizations will use to enhance their overall security with a simple experience designed to delight. That's, a, that's, that's an interesting way of phrasing it. With a simple experience designed to delight. That's that's how they'll promote the mark of the beast. It's a simple experience designed to delight that will lead you straight to the pits of hell. And we are heading right to the point of the one ruled government with this mark of the beast system where if you do not accept the mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. It's not going to be some great thing done for your convenience to keep you safer when you're online to make your life more convenient. It's going to be a way to completely control you and force you to worship the beast. <clears throat> All right. Uh, in Luke 21, Jesus talks about distress of nations with perplexity. Well, uh, let's look at the state of the United States right now. Here's a couple of stories about uh, Congress and, and Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, McCain to Obama, get over your temper tantrum, Mr. President, and focus on ISIS. This is out of Fox News today. Now, uh, <clears throat> John McCain said Sunday that President Obama is letting his personal issues with newly re-elected Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu affect his decision-making and shared policy goals. It's time that we work together with our Israeli friends and try to stem the tide of ISIS and Iranian movement throughout the region, which is threatening the very fabric of our region. During the interview, McCain called out Obama and told him, Get over your temper tantrum, Mr. President. McCain went on to admonish, the to admonish the administration's Middle East policies and said Obama's priorities are so screwed up that it's unbelievable. He added that he was convinced Obama was letting his personal feelings get in the way. McCain added that Israel is the only nation in the region where there was a free and fair democratic election and told and said that the least of our problems is what Benjamin Netanyahu said during an election campaign. McCain added that Bibi's rhetoric concerning an election campaign pales in comparison to the direct threat to the United States of America of ISIS. To the point, but the point is, is the JV, as the president described them, just moving over into Yemen? We see this horrible situation in Libya. We see ISIS everywhere in the world. Uh, what counts is we are providing Israel with critical security equipment technology that they need, and, and, and on that we are. Um, Barack Hussein Obama is having a temper tantrum as usual, but he also just fundamentally hates Israel. And I'm, again, not 100% sure he even likes the United States after all the comments he said about it, America since he became president. And because he doesn't seem to care that he's empowering the enemies that want to destroy America and Israel. I'm going to say it again. He's a Muslim. We have a Muslim in the White House who is against Israel. And he's against the Christians in America. And he's working to bring on the new world order. Henry Kissinger said when Barack Obama was elected, we're, bringing, we're, we're, we're priming Barack Hussein Obama. We're using him to bring in the new world order. And that's certainly what he's doing. Uh, let's look at another story uh, about the state of our nation and the president and Congress. And I certainly agree with this, but I don't think this will actually happen. Uh, it says, John McCain says, Congress should def defund the United Nations if the U.S. backs Palestinian bid. 
Senior Senator says Obama should get over his temper tantrum after Netanyahu's victory. It says, um, John McCain on Sunday uh, accused... Uh, let me skip over and get to the other part. Uh, okay, responding to signals from the White House that the U.S. could stop using its United Nations Security Council veto power to quash unilateral resolutions in support of the Palestinian statehood. McCain, uh, chairman of the powerful Senate Armed Services Committee, warned Obama against such a move. He said that if the U.S. acquiesced to a U.N. resolution calling for a Palestinian state, and if it were approved at the U.N., the United States Congress should have to examine our funding for the United Nations. Washington is the biggest is the single biggest funder of the international body, but current legislation permits defunding of any UN body that recognizes Palestinian statehood. It would be a violation because of the president's anger over a statement by the Prime Minister of Israel. It would contradict American policy for at least ten presidents of the United States. For years, the U.S. has rejected attempts to dictate the terms of an agreement between Israel and the Palestinians through the UN arguing that the only path to an effective settlement of the conflict is through a two-state solution reached by direct negotiations between the parties. Uh, so here we go. How does it look to America, to the world when, with America in the state that it's in, with Obama and Congress fighting all the time, with nothing getting done, and with us turning our back on Israel, and, and supposedly organizing this coalition to fight ISIS, but we're really not even doing much. Um... Uh, and by the way, when they did have their big march in Paris for peace and global unity, which I think signaled the rise of the New World Order, uh, Barack Hussein Obama wasn't even there. Um, so, and, and then of course when Benjamin Netanyahu came over here to speak, Congress, Barack Obama, wouldn't even go and listen. Neither would uh, a lot of the Democratic Congress or Joe Biden. Um, let's move on. PA preacher... When fish fight, Jews are to blame. This is all the Yeret Sheva, again, that peaceful Muslim religion. The PA, who wants to have a, a peace agreement, a two-state solution, two peoples living side by side in peace and security, continue to make statements like this. Humanity will never live in comfort as long as the Jews are causing devastating corruption. The Jews are behind all that is wrong in the world, according to the host of a weekly Palestinian TV program on Islam, cited by the Palestinian Media Watch. Even when fish fight in the sea, the Jews are behind it, said the Muslim preacher and professor of Quranic studies. To back up this anti-Semitic speech, hate speech, he went on to say that the Quran teaches that humanity will never live in comfort, peace, or fortune, or tranquility as long as the Jews are causing devastating corruption throughout the land. The solution for Muslims, according to the professor, is to fight Jews. Our real jihad is to take revenge. Humanity will never live in comfort as long as the Jews are causing devastating corruption throughout the land. Humanity will never live in peace or fortune or tranquility as long as they are corrupting the land. An old man told me if a fish in the sea fights with another fish, I am sure the Jews are behind it. As Allah says... Every time they kindled the fire of war against you, Allah extinguished it. They strive throughout the land, causing corruption, and Allah does not like corruptors. The PA's hate speech has been adopted by and large by the Palestinian public. Last year, the Anti-Defamation Anti League released a poll on anti-Semitism around the world and found that Palestinians have the most anti-Semitic attitudes in the world. The ADL survey found that 93% of adults in the West Bank and Gaza answered probably true to a majority of the anti-Semitic stereotypes tested in the survey. Um, again, the Bible says the whole world will turn against Israel in the last days, and that's exactly where we're at. The world is <laughs> taking the side of the Palestinians in the two-state solution concept. The European Union, the United Nations, the United States trying to pressure Israel to give up land. Two, people that want to blame the Jews for everything that's ever happened bad in the world and do not want to even re recognize their right to exist as the one and only Jewish state. Which again is exactly why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. 
Here's another interesting article about Israel and Obama. This is out of uh, uh, Before It's News. It says, um, Israel must realize that they have a greater enemy than Iran. Sadly, this greater enemy than Iran that this article is talking about is Barack Hussein Obama. For Israel, the consequences will be intended. Those who make excuses for Obama's policy failure as naive, bad advice, bad luck have not come to grips with his dark impulses and deep-seated rage. They quote Psalm 129.5, Let them all be confounded and turn back that hate Zion. First he comes from the banks, first he comes for the banks and health care, uses the IRS to go after critics politicizes the, the Justice Department, spies on journalists, tries to cur curb religious freedom, slashes the military, throws open the borders, doubles the debt, and nationalizes the Internet. He lies to the public, ignores the Constitution, inflames race relations, and urges Latinos to punish Republican enemies. He abandons our allies, appeases tyrants, coddles adversaries, and uses the Crusades as an excuse for inaction as Islamist terrorists slaughter their way throughout the Mideast. You know, I have to give whoever wrote that a hand. That is probably the best description of Barack Hussein Obama's two terms in the White House that I've ever seen. And it's very scary because this gentleman is still in the, in the Oval Office and still making our policies or ignoring our policies and writing, making new laws and walking all over our constitutional rights and bringing on the total destruction of America. People, it is time to wake up. Now he's coming for Israel. Barack Obama's promise to transform America was too modest. He's transforming the whole world before our eyes. Do you see it? Against the backdrop of the tsunami of trouble he has unleashed, Obama's pledge to reassess America's relationship with Israel cannot be taken lightly. Already paving the way for an Iranian nuke, he is hinting he'll also let the other anti-Semites at Turtle Bay have their way. That could mean American support for punitive Security Council resolutions for a Palestinian statehood. Whatever form the punishment takes, it will aim to teach Bibi Netanyahu never again to upstage him and to teach Israeli voters never again to, to elect somebody Obama doesn't like. Apologists and wishful thinkers, including some Jews, insist Obama realizes that the special relationship between Israel and the United States must prevail and that allowing too much daylight between friends will encourage enemies. Those people are slow learners or more dangerously deny us. It says, if Obama's six years in office teach us anything, it is that he is impervious to appeals to good sense. Quite the contrary. Even respectful suggestions from supporters that he behave in the traditions of American presidents fill him with, fill him with angry determination to do it his way. For Israel, the consequences will be intended. Those who make excuses for Obama's policies, failures, naive, bad luck, and have come to grips with his dark impulses and deep-seated rage. That refusal is now the excuse to act against Israel. Consider that for all the upheaval around the world, the president rarely has a crossword for, let alone an open dispute with, any foreign leader, any other foreign leader. He calls Great Britain's David uh, Cameron bro and praised Egypt's mother, uh, Muslim Brotherhood president, Mohamed Morsi, who called who had called Zionists the descendants of apes and pigs. Obama asked Vladimir Putin for patience, promising more flexibility after 2012 election. Uh, <clears throat> his Asian pivot was a head fake, and China is exploiting the vacuum. It's a clear and glowing, glaring double standard. Most troubling is Obama's bended knee deference to Iran's supreme leader, which has been... Repaid with death to America and death to Israel demonstrations in, Te in Tehran and expanded Iranian military action in other countries. Um, yet Netanyahu, the leader of her only reliable ally in the region, is repeatedly singled out for abuse. He alone is the target of an orchestrated attempt to defeat him at the polls. With Obama political operatives funded in part by American taxpayers working to elect his opponent. They failed, and Netanyahu prevailed because Israelis see him as their best bet to protect them. Their choice was wise, but they better buckle up because it's Israel's turn to face the wrath of Obama. That is uh, scary if you're an American, although it is exciting if you're born-again, believing, 
follower of Jesus Christ looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior in the sky because he is going to come soon. And all these signs that we're seeing are direct fulfillment of prophecy. All right, here's an interesting story that came out a couple of days ago. Or, uh, i got to get into this. Pope Francis credited for half miracle. Uh, wow, i got some scripture to go with this one. Um, Pope Francis credited with half miracle. So some say Pope Francis might be responsible for a half miracle. During a Mass in Naples on Saturday, he was given a vial of dried blood be belonging to St. Gennaro, the city's patron saint. The Archbishop of Naples says when Francis kissed the glass, the blood half liquefied, and the Cardinal declared it a miracle. The Pope then joked that he and his congregation had to work harder since, quote, the saint only loves us halfway. Uh, there is, that is wrong on so many levels. <laughs> Kissing a vial of blood from a supposed dead saint. Uh, the idolatry, the praying to saints, the praying to Mary, the relics, the supposed miracles. It's wake up. And if you're in the Catholic Church, come out of her while you still can, that you be not partaker of her plague. She is going to be judged here soon. Uh, even Catholic prophecy says that the final pope will lead the destruction of the Roman Church. Uh, but come on, really? So, uh, he's credited with a half miracle. Pope Francis credited with a half miracle. Well, first of all, all miracles come from God and through God and only through God by His Holy Spirit, period. And I would like to ask any of you to read the Gospels. And give me one example where Jesus ever performed half of a miracle. And any miracle that happen, happens today is not because of the person who said the prayer. It's from the power of the Holy Spirit, period. Um, but there are lying signs and wonders coming. So let's just turn to some scripture uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 to 12. Uh, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in this time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Verse 9, very important, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. That they might be saved and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure and unrighteousness. Let's go to Revelation real quick. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 to 17. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth, and them which dwell therein, to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Verse 13, And he doeth great wonders. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and cause that as many as would not worship the beast should be killed, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. 
uh, lying signs and wonders. And quite possibly the only reason Pope Francis can do half a miracle right now is because he hasn't officially become one of the two beasts yet. Satan hasn't officially entered him yet. The restraining power of the Holy Spirit is still here. But when that is taken away, when the Holy Spirit filled and dwelled church and the fullness of the Gentiles come in and the Holy Spirit is removed and Satan can then have total control, maybe those half miracles, those half false lying signs and wonders miracles will no longer be half miracles, but they will be full out if, they, if possible could deceive even the very elect miracles. It is, again, time to make sure you are saved and covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is coming for his church, and I would not want to be here when the Holy Spirit is, <laughs> is no longer withholding Satan and the evil. Uh, one more story. Uh, ruled, <laughs> ruled Water Day. 2015, the United Nations calls for global unity in pursuit of better water access for all. Uh, again, Agenda 21, a United Nations uh, program, a global United Nations pro program, to control the resources, control the environment, to control the population, to control the people, as is the mark of the beast, to control the people. And uh, again, more calls for global unity for the good of common humanity and uh, the rise of the beast. Oh, uh, here we go. As the perils of climate change increasingly threaten the planet, the international community must unite in a spirit of urgent cooperation to address the many water-related challenges facing humanity, United Nations Secretary Gen General Ban Ki-moon declared today. In his message, making the 2015 edition of World Water Day observed annually on 22nd of March, the, the, second, the Secretary General warned that access to safe drinking water and sanitation was among the most urgent issues affecting populations across the globe. The onset of climate change, growing demand on finite water resources from agriculture, industry, and cities, and increasing pollution in many areas are hastening a water crisis that can only be addressed by cross-sectoral, holistic planning and policies, internationally, regionally, and globally, which is exactly what Agenda 21 is. Despite progress under the Millennial Development Goals, some 750 million people, or more than 1 in 10 in the world's population, remain out without access to an improved water supply. Uh, this is a real long article. I'll post all the, these links in the description box so you can check them out yourself. But here we go again uh, with climate change, water shortages. The Bible says there's going to be famines, pestilence. But let's go specifically with what else it has to say about warm, uh, climate change and weather and water. Uh, Revelation chapter 16, verses 4 to 16. Uh, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the waters, and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast, and shalt be, because thou hast judged us. And they have shed the blood, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, for thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, O Lord. God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. That's global warming right there. There's climate change. But God says it's coming, and it's going to be a sign of God's judgment. You haven't seen anything yet when it comes to climate change and global warming. I'm going to read that verse again. Uh, and the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. 
and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirit of devils, working miracles again, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and into the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth garments, um, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The Euphrates River is already drying up considerably. I did an art, I did a video almost a year ago and in it I posted a picture of a sheep grazing in the middle of the Euphrates River because it has dried up. That is a sign straight from the book of Revelation that the Euphrates River will dry up to allow for the kings of the east to march into the battle of Armageddon. The water supply right now is good compared to where it's going to be when the water is turned to blood, and people won't be able to drink. Now, that's already been happening in symbolically. There have been several blood lakes, blood, blood red, uh, tide, no, red tides and things happening around the world for the last several years. That is not a fulfillment of the book of Revelation, but it should be opening your eyes to the fact that it is going to happen for real. Um, and then... Again, we keep hearing about global warming, but the sun is going to get so hot it's going to scorch people on the earth. Praise God, you do not have to be here for that. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. In a letter to, the, to uh, Philadelphia, Jesus says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation that shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Jesus Christ died for you. He shed his blood Calvary for you. If you are not saved, today is the day of salvation. He is coming back so soon and it is time to make sure you're ready. All of the signs that Jesus told us to look for are here. Call upon him now in faith. He will save you. That's why he died. He died on the cross to save you. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you are running out of time. Keep looking up, and God bless everyone.